we had a meeting some days ago and when I met you, you said, oh, you just uh, have a bruise on your forehead. You were uh, beating guns. And so something that <laughs> for that meeting. Uh, yeah, so really walk, you walked the talk and I'm excited about what you have to share with us tonight. So you have the word. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm just humbled and delighted to be a part of the, the conversation today, uh, tonight. And uh, for this first session, I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit about the intersection of prayer and action. And then in the second session, we'll be reflecting a little bit more on um, politics, right? That, that um, God is healing hearts, personal salvation is real, but God's also healing a broken world. And we're kind of invited to participate in that. So I'm really so glad that, you know, this is a conversation too. So in this first 20 minutes or so, I'll, I'll just offer us something to get us talking. And I remember uh, several years ago, I got a letter from a young man who said, I find myself pretty lonely uh, because I'm surrounded by unbelieving activists and inactive believers. <laughs> and he, he said, I, I'm longing to find a community of Christians who um, believe in prayer, but also believe in getting up off of our knees and, you know, putting prayers into action. And that's, you know, what we've really been after for the last uh, 25 years or so in our work in Philadelphia. When I first became a Christian and I grew up in the church, it became clear to me that um, prayer can become a place to hide from the responsibility that God might to want to entrust us with. And I believe passionately about prayer. I mean, we just prayed getting ready for this evening. I hope you're prayerful as we, you know, uh, go through the evening. Uh, I believe in miracles. I believe that God intervenes in the world and that God is alive and, and working in the world. Um, I also think that um, there are times where Christians have focused so much on life after death that we've missed life before death. And I know a lot of people who um, are living in really troubled situations and Christians are just saying, well, there's life after death. There's heaven after you die. And I've become convinced that Jesus did not just come to prepare us to die, but to teach us how to live and how to love and how to transform this world from what it is now into what God wants it to be. Uh, and um, the kingdom of God that Jesus talks about almost every time he opens his mouth. One other way of thinking about that language, because it's, you know, it's kind of old school language, but the kingdom of God is really the dream of God, right? Um, and, and when Jesus talks about the dream of God, the kingdom of God, it's not just something that we're to go up to when we die, but something we're to bring on earth while we live. And that's the prayer that Jesus taught, you know, that we would pray that the, the, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that we would seek first the kingdom of God. And I grew up with a version of prayer that was just about making prayer requests to God. And we would have them in youth group, you know, everybody would raise their hands and we would say all the things that we were hoping God would do for us. And I do think that that is a part of prayer. But if we aren't careful, then we can end up like one of my friend's kids. Uh, he said, I'm going up to pray. Does anybody want anything? You know, <laughs> and it just becomes kind of a list that we rattle off. Um, and I've come to think of prayer more as it's not just us trying to get God to do what we want God to do, but it's also about us being transformed into people that are acting and living into the dream of God on earth as it is in heaven. One of the places that I learned a deeper part of prayer was in Calcutta, India. 
and some some of you may know uh, that are a little familiar with with my story that I when I was about 20 years old, I went over to India and I worked with Mother Teresa and the sisters and uh, they had a very active life. It was very uh, exhausting work, uh, working in the orphanages, working in the um, home for the dying, where we would hold people's hands every day as they died. We'd go into the streets and we would bring people in who were dying. Uh, and every day people were dying. So it was very uh, tiring, not just physically, but spiritually. And I saw how immersed their life of action um, and activity and compassion, it was just absolutely rooted in prayer. We prayed all through the day. Um, we woke up at five o'clock in the morning, which is not my favorite hour, uh, but we got up and we prayed. And most mornings I, you know, I drug myself in there because it was so important. And I began to realize that the prayers that we were praying every morning were not just requests trying to get God to do what we want God to do, but they were about us being transformed. So this is one of the prayers that we prayed every morning in India. It's a prayer maybe that you can hold on to as well. Dear God, may every person I come in contact with feel your presence in my soul. And then it said, and may I leave off your fragrance everywhere I go. Uh, all, all, so many of the prayers were about God filling us with the Holy Spirit. So we would have the hope, the energy, the joy, the love to do this work. And um, it was also uh, important to Mother Teresa that we had communion every morning. And I, I, I was kind of struck by how redundant that was. You know, every morning we're going to do communion. And we were talking to one of the nuns about it. You know, when I, in my church growing up, you did communion like once a month and that covered it, you know, <laughs> and, but in India, we did it every morning. We we're talking to one of the nuns and she said, well, have you heard the saying, we are what we eat? And she's like, that's pretty much what communion, the Eucharist is to us. It's, it's reminding ourselves that we are the ones being transformed by communion, by the Eucharist. We are praying that we would become what we eat, that we would be the hands and feet of God to the world, God's love made flesh. And that begins to transform how we think about our life, right? As we think uh, there's a depth to what Paul said, that the life I live, I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me. It also makes me think that Sometimes when we pray, we might be waiting on God to do things that God is waiting on us to do. Like our politicians and our preachers, after every mass shooting in America, people go on social media, politicians and preachers, and they talk about how their thoughts and prayers go out to the victims. But then these same politicians refuse to to take action, to do concrete things that would prevent more lives being lost to guns. And so I think it's literally a, a form of taking the Lord's name in vain. When we are saying, God, we need you to do something, when God may be also uh, empowering us to do something. And when our community started in Philadelphia, uh, this is 20 years ago, there was a group of homeless families that uh, had nowhere to go. And there were 3,000 families on the waiting list for housing. It was a 10-year waiting list. And these families, had they, they saw all of the abandoned buildings that we have, and they moved into an abandoned Catholic church building, and they began living there. And sadly, the response of the Catholic Church was that they were trespassing, even though the church was abandoned for years, and that they could be arrested if they didn't get out of the abandoned build, the abandoned sanctuary. We read in the newspaper that story, and we, like good evangelical Christians, we had a prayer meeting that night. 
but I'll never forget. It was one of the clearest moments that I felt like we were throwing our hands up at God and we were saying, God, we need you to do something. And we felt God say back, I did do something. I made you. And, you know, we went down that night and we found that cathedral. And on the front of it, the families had hung a banner that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? They were brilliant and beautiful and wise. These were mostly mothers and children, about a hundred of them that were living in there. And they held a press conference and they said to the church officials, we mean you no disrespect, uh, but we've talked to the real owner of this building, God. <laughs> And God said that we can stay. And, uh, and they stayed and we organized a student solidarity movement alongside them. And it was one of those moments, you know, where um, many of those families got housing. Uh, it exposed the struggle of homelessness in Philadelphia. Uh, and I do believe that we saw some really miraculous things and we saw God at work in all of it. But probably one of the greatest miracles that we learned through all of that is that we are invited to be a part of answering the prayers that we pray. One of my mentors said, it's great to pray for our neighbor who needs a wheelchair ramp. But if every week we find ourselves praying for our neighbor to get a wheelchair ramp so they can get into their home, Maybe we need to get up off of our knees and organize some carpenters, <laughs> right? And build a wheelchair ramp. So it's a delicate dance, isn't it? That we, we want to be people of prayer and we want to be people of action. And we want to be people who wait on God, but we don't want to be people who uh, God is waiting on uh, for, for us to really respond. And so I sometimes think of, of prayer and action like blades of scissors, right? That they have to go together. And, you know, so many of the things that we separate from each other, um, faith and works, right? Um, evangelism and social justice, um, the, the personal salvation and social healing, they're like blades of scissors that they really operate best when we hold them together. And when you take them apart, we miss a whole part of the gospel. So as, you know, as we think through this together, um, I want to invite you to think about a story that may be familiar to some of us. Uh, it may be fresh or new for others of us, uh, it, but it's a story that's in the gospel. And uh, I'm just going to kind of retell it, but the story goes sort of like this. Jesus is preaching to cr a crowd of thousands and thousands of people. And um, as he's speaking, the people begin to get hungry. And they begin to, uh, uh, th they're really hungry. And so the, the disciples notice this. And I think that's really important, first of all, is that the disciples noticed the hunger. Because Christians don't always notice the, the pain of the people or the suffering, the struggle. They notice that people are hungry. And they come to Jesus, which is another good thing. You know, they come to Jesus and they bring it to Jesus and they say, uh, the people are hungry. You, you need to do something. But Jesus's response is, is just beautiful. He goes back to the disciples and he throws it right back to them and he says, you do something, feed the people. And the disciples, you know, immediately uh, are, you know, baffled by this. They're like, I mean, how in the world are we going to come up with that much food? You know, there's not a grocery store nearby. And, uh, uh, you, you, you know, we don't have enough money to buy, buy food for everybody. We don't have enough food. And Jesus says, what do you have? And there's a little kid that is willing to share his lunch of fish and loaves. And they bring that to Jesus. And, and God adds uh, a little God stuff, you know, to it. And they begin to pass it out. And everyone eats. And it's, there's baskets left over. But what I love about that story um, is that 
the little kid got to be a part of the miracle. The disciples got to be a part of the miracle. And I would suggest to us today that one of the greatest mysteries and wonders of our faith is that God does not want to change the world without us. That we are invited to be a part of this redemption story. We're invited to be a part of the miracle uh, uh, that, that God wants to do. And, and I even think that maybe part of why Jesus didn't turn stones into bread, because this was a temptation of the devil to kind of misuse his power and do it all on his own in a way that was different from God's most perfect will. And maybe part of why that was the case is that we've, we've helped to create the mess that we're in right now. And God doesn't want to just magically solve the pain of the world without us being a part of that healing. And so I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, right, that we can pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But then we also need to be listening as we pray, listening to how God might want us to get off of our knees and begin to participate in actively changing the world from what it is into what God wants it to be. I think that's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I love the image of Mike and Isaiah uh, of beating swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks, you know, uh, this is the work that has inspired us to transform guns into garden tools. But one of the reasons that I love this, uh, this image, both Micah and Isaiah talk about uh, that, that we will beat our swords into plows, our spears into pruning hooks. And then there's this beautiful image uh, and vision for a world where we will study violence no more. But what's interesting is that peace begins with the people, the people of God. It doesn't come, change doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. And it's the people who get so frustrated with violence, so fatigued, so tired of violence, that they take things into their own hands and they begin to transform the metal of their weapons, metal that was crafted to kill and repurpose it into metal that's crafted for life, to cultivate life. Uh, and just to show you a couple of images, since most of us, I think, are watching uh, on, the, on the, the video, this is one of the, the shovels that we made. So this is a shovel made from a gun. That's the barrel of a gun. In fact, you can, if you look closely there, you can see the markings of the old, it was a Winchester uh, rifle, and, and the, the uh, wood is made from the wood of the gun. So we've been making these, uh, you know, swords into plows, uh, guns in the garden tools, but every time we do it, it feels like we are participating, right, in that vision, and Walter Brueggemann, who is uh, a wonderful theologian, you may have read some of his stuff, he wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, and one of the things that he suggests is that we've sort of misunderstood the prophets, and we think sometimes that the biblical prophets were uh, fortune tellers, that they're trying to predict the future. And he says, that's not quite it. They, they weren't fortune tellers, they were truth tellers. And they weren't just trying to predict the future. They were trying to change the future, the future that we're headed towards by waking us up and by, by inviting us to reimagine the way that the world is. So Every time we transform a gun into a garden tool, we are declaring that all things can be made new. It doesn't have to be this way, right? And, and just as metal can tra be transformed, so can our hearts. Someone who's killed someone, their heart can be transformed. A world that seems so 
addicted to violence can turn from death to life. But it begins with us. The change begins with us. We can't wait on change to begin with politicians. Uh, I think that's what it means to be the body of Christ, is that we are to be the prophetic conscience, that we are to stir people's hearts with compassion, and we are to invite the world to imagine a different future from the one that we're headed to uh, toward right now. So this idea that we are uh, to be the change, that we are to uh, be a part of the miracle, that when, when we look at the world and we say, God, why do masses of people live in poverty while a handful of people have more than anyone could ever imagine spending? Literally, as you all know, less than 100 people, 100 of the richest people in the world own the same amount as half the world's population three and a half billion people. We have weapons that are a hundred times stronger than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb. Here in the United States, we've got the capacity of over 100,000 Hiroshima bombs. And we are the only country that has used them, dropped them on a civilian population. And we did it twice in one week. So we look at that and we say, we've got to go a different direction. And I would suggest that's exactly why you've joined this call. What we're talking about here is we want to be people who pray, but we also want to be people who get up off of our knees and we act towards what we're praying. We become the change that we want to see uh, in the world. We, we begin to put flesh on those prayers. And that's uh, what, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the church, uh, you know, the old saying is that sometimes we've been so heavenly minded that we're not much earthly good. And I think there's a whole generation of young people who are leaving the church because we're just promising people life after death when they're wondering, doesn't the gospel have anything to say to this world? And the good news is the gospel has a whole lot to say to this world. This is not just about going to heaven when we die. It is also about uh, bringing the kingdom on, on earth while we live. And, and so, you know, at the end of the day, Jesus says, we're all going to be gathered before God. And we're going to be asked a few questions. And according to Jesus in Matthew 25, these are not just doctrinal questions. I think the things that we believe are really important. But according to Jesus in Matthew 25, at the end of the day, we're not just going to be asked how old we believe the world is. You know, is it 10,000 years old? Is it 100, is it 10 million years old? We're not just going to be asked if we believe in the virgin birth. Those things may be important, but at the end of the day, we're going to be asked, when I, was in hung, when, when I was in prison, did you come visit me? When I was a stranger, did you welcome me in? When I was an immigrant, a refugee, did you welcome me? When I was hungry, did you make sure I had food? When I was in need of health care and sick, uh, did you make sure that I was cared for? Our works don't earn our salvation, but our works demonstrate our salvation. They show our salvation. And in, in the end, the scripture says that we can have faith to move mountains and speak in the tongues of men and of angels and fathom all of the depths, the, the, the depths of knowledge and do all kinds of miracles and prophecies. But if we do not have love, then it's still empty. And so prayers need to be fleshed out in love. And the real test of our faith is how it manifests itself to the least of these, to the most vulnerable people in our world. So thank you so much for letting me share a little bit. I'll share a little bit more later, but I want to stop there uh, to say it's so wonderful to be a part of a conversation that believes both in, in prayer and in, in action. Uh, so thank you for letting me share and get us started. Well, thank you, Shane, for this uh, first talk, which uh, I'm sure gets already 
a lot of food for thought for ourselves. Um, and that's really what we want to dive into now, since uh, we can hear a lot of good stuff, but we need to translate it in our lives and reflect it and think about it and what that, that what does that mean for our lives and uh, so that's where you can now get all into action we take around 10 minutes in these groups and you just talk about two questions um, just talk about what what uh, message did you pick up what touched your heart from what Jane um, talk to us and what does that mean for your life um so take take the take this time in the group and maybe someone in the group takes the lead just to moderate a little bit so it picks up and uh discuss it in this group uh, i'll give you the question and after that we will have um, a time of q a um regarding these topics we already have Yes, I hope you had some good um, discussions uh, in your groups. So, I have one question to you, Shane, which is uh, due to our uh, really actual situation that we are facing globally, but really affects us in, in, in the European context as well, is the war in the Ukraine. Um, so, one person asks, is it clear? It is clear that supporting an invasion is not right. But how about supporting Ukrainians in their defense? And is there a Christian responsibility to protect? What would you answer here? That's really an actual question. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously uh, what's happening over there uh, is, is just haunting and tragic and... Um, all of us are trying to think through what we can do to uh, respond. In a, and, and I think the question too is, for those of us who are trying to be faithful to Jesus, what is a Christ-like response? Um, there's sort of a, a point where in my own faith, I found it impossible to reconcile violence with the cross, with Jesus. Um, uh, but, you know, my, my dad was in the military. Um, we have obviously a very deep rooted affinity to God and war and guns and military. But I think that what Jesus does is show us that we are to live in a violent world without mirroring that violence. I think it's impossible to love our enemies and simultaneously prepare to kill them. Um, Peter, Peter, I think, had the strongest case in the world of trying to use violence to protect Jesus when he picked up his sword and used it uh, against the folks that were coming to arrest Jesus. And Jesus scolded him, you know, and said, live by the sword, die by the sword, put that away. And then he healed the man that Jesus wounded. So the early Christians really understood that as the final triumph over redemptive violence, um, Tertullian one of the great thinkers of the early church said, when Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed every one of us. Um, so I think that, that the understanding of Christianity for hundreds of years was that for Christ, we can die, but we cannot kill. We cannot legitimate violence. Um, and, and so I think the, the question is like, what does, it, what, what does it look like to be as courageous for the cross, as people have been for the gun or the, you know, the, the sword or the bomb. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can be doing to faithfully respond in a way that honors Jesus. And one of those is by uh, calling for the disarmament of the world, beginning with ourselves. And I think this is the irony here in the U.S., is that we've been the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. We've had weapons contracts with over 150 countries. Uh, we literally, uh, in 2003, were dropping 900 bombs a day 
on Iraq, and I, I lived in Iraq as a part of a peace uh, team trying to stop the war. Um, so we, we've got to stop, stand against all violence. And I think if Christians, um, Christians uh, decided we're not going to kill, uh, it would do a lot of damage to the war machine. <laughs> you know, if uh, they, you know, if we refuse to kill and refuse to fight in the wars. Um, uh, so the last thing, you know, I think that we we can be welcoming uh, immigrants and refugees. We can be responding with compassion. We can be calling all of our governments not to perpetuate the violence by adding more violence. Um, and then I think we need to be creative with getting underneath the things that lead to violence uh, and, and to stop arming the world. We're, we're not going to arrive at peace by killing each other's children. And so we have, a, we have a decision right now of whether or not we want to live by the sword and die by the sword. But I think we've learned that lesson over and over and over that the sword is a dead end road and you can't end violence by adding more violence. It just, you know, adds fuel to the fire. Thank you. Yeah, this, this arms is surely a topic and uh, maybe a long term approach. Um, I have another question to, to this topic, which goes maybe a little bit more into details. If you are now in the Ukraine, uh, what do you do as a Christian, as non-violent peacemaking? What can you do in, in this situation when you are attacked by the Russians? Yeah, I mean, I sure want to hear what you all have to say, too. I think we're all asking a lot of the same yeah. questions. But uh, the, the good thing is that there is a precedent for this, right? Like that the one thing that I really think is so important as we think about Jesus. There are folks that would suggest that Jesus is impractical, you know, um, and that the Sermon on the Mount, loving your enemies, is really good for an individual, but it's really terrible policy for nations. And I, I would suggest that, that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount in the midst of a lot of violence. I mean, when he is born, Herod is killing children. The Christians are, you know, hung on crosses, fed the beasts. I mean, the, the reality of violence and evil was very real to Jesus. Even as he's dying on the cross, he shows us God's love, absorbing the violence of the world and subverting it with love and forgiveness and an empty tomb. So I think that's what God is like. What does it look like to follow that God is what we're all asking. And um, there are really powerful movements throughout history that have been nonviolent movements that can really uh, inspire us today. I mean, sometimes we look at the worst scenarios like Hitler or like what's happening in Ukraine and go, what do we do now? And there are lots of things I think that we can do in the in-between times, you know, not just in the middle of a new crisis and conflict, but I mean, frankly, you know, Hitler came to power with the Bible in his hand on the back of a complicit church. And right now, you know, I think Christians need to be a force for love and nonviolence. We need to be a part of the resistance uh, in every way that we can be. Um, so maybe other folks have more, you know, teeth to put on that. But I, I, those are a few things that I think we can be doing. Yeah, it's really something that we all have to think about and question. It's uh, something we also talked about in our team last year and wrestled with this question, what to do. Um, we might go to another question which goes a little bit in another direction. Um, have you become less radical over the years or what do you do to sustain your motivation? Well, uh, this is a, this is fun. I, I, I think that I, part of what sustains my motivation is being surrounded by folks who, um, they're, they're, they are courageous, you know, and so they rub off, we rub off on each other. Courage is contagious. And so I think many of the values that we're talking about are very countercultural values. So you need a critical mass, you know, you need a community that, um, you know, just when you're, a, when you're a teenager, you hear about peer pressure as a, a really bad thing. But I think what Christian community is about 
is creating a, a different version of that, that uh, gravity towards love and generosity and courage. So um, when people tell me that, you know, radical Christianity is a phase of youth, I like to introduce them to my friend, Sister Margaret, who's 90 years old <laughs> and still marching in the street, still going to jail, you know? Um, so, um, and I think there's a lot of different things that radical faith looks like, you know, for it's not all one, one way that we, you know, are part of this kind of countercultural gospel, but, um, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of struggles here in the U S so it's not, um, it's very easy to, uh, to, to look at the United States and go, my gosh, we've lost our minds, you know, so we we're going to jail very often, uh, uh over here for the good trouble, you know, the nonviolent civil disobedience, uh, our government is ex is still executing people by the death penalty. We've still got an epidemic of gun violence. Some of the things that your countries, uh, in some ways have moved on from, but the tendency I think is to look at the United States and say, at least we're not that bad <laughs> and, and, and get and let yourself off the hook, you know? So I would say, don't, um, don't set the bar that low. Right. But let's all be asking like in our context, what does it look like to be faithful to Jesus and to what Roman says, let's not conform to the patterns of this world, but live differently with a different imagination. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, welcoming immigrants and refugees, um, extending our social networks and our friends beyond the people who look like us and talk like us. All of those things, I think, are fundamental, like small ways that we, um, we live out the kind of countercultural values of the gospel, ways that we share money together. You know, those look different for us now than they did 20 years ago. But I think it's the same desire, you know, like the early church, to share everything in common, um, to be consistently for life and to stand against violence in every iteration that it has. Um, so I, I, I hope we haven't compromised on any of those. I, I don't think we have. And part of how we've sustained ourselves is by keeping um, that fire alive by surrounding ourselves with other people that are pursuing those same values that are, that are often very countercultural. All right, thank you very much, Shane. Let's surround ourselves with people who are courageous. Uh, we are a group of people together now here from Switzerland. Maybe you have not, uh, yeah, are a little bit alone in these topics, or uh, but get get surrounded with these people, and maybe that's also information for you that we have these regional groups of Stop Armut, at least in the German part of. Uh, Switzerland, which might be some sort of, of group who think about these questions together. How can we in, yeah, engage into these questions of injustice and poverty in this earth and how can we make a difference? So if you are alone, you are welcome to join one of these groups. Um, and I'm sure you find other ways and other people who are courageous at the place that you are and in the themes that you care about.